Добрый день. Приветствуем вас на презентации первого в этом году и четвертого. Hello and welcome. We would like to thank you for participating another track of changes issue. I would like to remind you that this is a joint analytical um, report that is prepared by six, jointly by six experts. Here are the our speakers and experts. Pavel Slunkin, visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Hello, Pavel. Hello. Artem Scheibman, political analyst and founder of the Sense Analytics Consultancy. Hello. Philip Bicano, independent sociologist. Hennad Korshinov, program director of the Belarusian Academy and senior analyst at the Center for New Ideas. And Katerina Bornukova, academic director at Baroque and visiting professor at Carlos University in Madrid. Lev Lvovsky, Baroque senior research fellow. I'd like to remind you that today we have a uh, uh, interpretation into English. So if you like, please switch into the uh, English track if you want to listen to us in English. If you want to ask questions, please select the appropriate track. If you select the English track, you will hear everyone in English. If you select the track, which is called Russian in my Zoom settings. You will hear us all in Belarusian and in Russian, depending on the guest speaking. The format today is the following. Each speaker will briefly tell us about their own part of the research, then we'll have a Q&A. You're welcome to write your questions in the chat or um, raise your hand in the chat, and we will connect you. We'll start with the welcome words of Christopher Fur forced director of the Belarusian office of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation program. Please, the floor is yours, Christopher. Thank you very much, uh, dear guests. Welcome to the launch of the fourth edition of the Belarus Change Tracker in the name of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Our foundation has supported the BCT since the first edition. We're glad to once again have six excellent experts here who collaborated to come up with a unique product that goes more in depth than any comparable publication the combination of political and economic expertise, as well as a sociological survey, make this project special, especially in the Belarusian context, where sociological data is rare and hard to get. Uh, not everything that will be presented in the sociological survey part of this edition will please the majority of attendees of this launch. Not surprising for sociological surveys that this can be the case, uh, yet the extent and consistency with uh, which it is the case in this edition of the BCT and has been over the past editions of this publication may indeed be surprising for some. But the big strength of the format at hand is that the political and economic sections deliver explanations for what may have influenced the sociological survey results, albeit you may have to think twice to understand possible causal links. It also gives the opportunity to look back uh, for a longer time frame that goes beyond what happened in the last week or so and use this analysis for the formulation of future policy strategies. The first three editions have been rightly quoted and recognized. Uh, we hope this one will be too. Uh, I wish you an interesting launch. I want to congratulate the authors as well as my colleagues, uh, Teresa and Valeria, who have been working on this project. Uh, the publication is already available in our AVS digital library and we'll share the link later. Um, you can also find some other studies which we have recently supported and we'll be pleased if you take a look. Thank you very much and now over to our experts. Thank you, Christopher. Indeed, uh, the floor is not, will now be given to our experts and we'll start with Pavel Slunkin. Pavel, please, the floor is yours. So I have five minutes, right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I'll try to be brief. And uh, the main trend that I noticed, I'll be talking about foreign policy. The main trend, the foreign policy of Belarus became the significant successes of uh, Belarusian diplomacy. And uh, Belarus has been using the foreign visit of Lukashenko to demonstrate its legitimacy or foreign policy importance. And here, the most weighty visit became uh, Lukashenko's visit to Beijing, uh, Belarus and Chinese relationship for Lukashenko's regimes have always been very important. And the last time uh, Xi 
ping uh, came to Belarus in 2015, 2020, they tried to invite him again uh, to Belarus, but then it uh, was prevented by the COVID infection in 2021. There was internal political situation that was not uh, great for the visit, and so uh, he never came in 2020. And Lukashenko even hadn't visited uh, Beijing on official visit since 2016, so he came there for the first time uh, since 2016, well, without a doubt, for Belarusian authorities, the foreign policy meeting, considering the fact that Lukashenko after 2020 did not really go outside um, borders of Belarus except uh, Russia and maybe Azerbaijan. He, he did not participate at the international conferences. So this visit to Beijing became one of the most significant and weighty ones, but not the only one. Over the, over the last three months, uh, Lukashenko became more active in, in terms of his um, visits. Uh, he went to Zimbabwe, as we know, and it was a breakthrough visit, so-called breakthrough visit, although it wasn't really, considering the relationship and the potential they have, I mean, between Belarus and Zimbabwe, still it is presented by the big success of the Belarus foreign policy. At the same time, the Lukashenko managed to visit the UAE, managed to solve some issues of uh, the semi-state character, semi-state nature, but it doesn't really count. I would really uh, add here that uh, apart from uh, Lukashenko's visits, there were successes in terms of uh, visits into Belarus. There was a working visit of the head of the Hungarian Foreign Ministry since 2020. This has been the first uh, EU country's foreign minister's visit to Belarus. During the press conference that the Hungarian Foreign Minister mm, conducted with the head of the Belarusian foreign ministry. He didn't speak about the role of uh, Belarus in the war, did not criticize Belarus about the human rights issues, but he concentrated on the positive trends, positive for the Belarusian authorities, like the fact that Belarus can become the platform of peaceful negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. He criticized EU sanction policy and uh, uh, lauded the relationship between Hungary and Belarus. Similar statement came from Archbishop and Belarusian propagandists uh, highlighted on this, including the deputy head of foreign ministry, and they're planning to and uh, trying to um, decrease this toxicity towards Belarusian regime. They don't, uh, they don't really succeed, I must say. The second important factor here and consequential one, which cannot be called haphazard, is that Belarus was not added into the third uh, sanction package of the EU, even though the officials of the EU said that Belarus would fall under the sanctions, Belarus never made the list. So there could be several explanations to that. I would say that uh, the most important two ones are that uh, the majority of EU countries do, don't, do not wish to increase pressure on Belarus without significant involvement of Belarus into the military action. And second could be the absence of the political stimuli inside the EU, and they don't want to deal with the secondary case related to Russia, including the fact that there are some different approaches towards the um, sanctions towards Minsk, Lithuania, Poland, and uh, Central East European countries make one part and countries like Portugal, Belgium, and Italy wants to um, put Minsk away from the, uh, the this blow and, and pressure. And the, and the last recent success is that Vladimir Putin visited Lukashenko in Minsk, not the other way around, although such visits have not been happening over the last three years. And uh, Belarusians can really also 
claim it as a success. The second trend of the global block of trends here, we talk about the fragile balance towards Ukraine and Ukrainian authorities and Belarusian regime. Here as well, there are two factors that we can highlight. Radio Liberty correspondent spoke about this. He said that Belarus is not part of the sanctions package, uh, among other things, because of the Ukrainian position. We could also uh, claim that major role here is played by the absence of the shelling of the Ukrainian ter territory from Belarus for a long time. There were some unpleasant uh, instances for Belarusian democratic forces, like non-willingness of uh, participation with uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, the uh, um, anniversary of the 1863 uprising. So we analyzed the statement of Belarusian, of Ukrainian authorities, and we saw the, the, the wish to a desire to to show that Lukashenko is not as criminal as bad as criminal as Putin and that they're trying to we see that they're trying to move him away from this dark topic so representatives of the Ukrainian uh, for intelligence saying that Lukashenko is doing his best not to get involved in the war and he's uh, it's really hard for him Mr. Podolyak also said that he uh, doesn't think it's important to develop a relationship with the Belarusian democratic forces because he doesn't see any anti-military activities on their side and understanding of the war. At the same time, after that statement, in some cities of the world, there were um, huge uh, events and solidarity actions with Ukraine prompted by Tikhanovskaya several days later. A uh, Russian plane, A-50, was attacked in the Machulish airfield in Belarus. Uh, responsibility was taken by, with assumed by Russian partisans and by Paul, which is part of the Tikhanovskaya's office. But uh, Ukrainian authorities did not comment on that, that uh, they neither can supported that, Belarusian activities, activists, no, they commented it in any way. So they just distanced themselves from this event. And uh, they're also continuing the trend to uh, strengthen the Iron Curtain. Belarus is getting isolated. Poland, Ukraine, and Lithuania are leaving the bilateral agreements. And there are fewer responsibilities, both economic and humanitarian ones, for Belarusians to be connected with European countries. The wall that has been erected is not a, a figure of speech, it is a real wall, and Belarusian uh, uh, state border troops say that there are almost uh, the border uh, wall is almost 1,000 kilometers in length. I believe um, I'm out of time and I should stop here. Pavel, if you want to add something, please do that. Well, if to be brief, I must say that this isolation that Belarusian authorities subject Belarusian people to, opposed by the democratic forces headed by Tikhanovska, I, uh, I can't see any global successes here. They're trying to um, balance the negative consequences of Belarusian, of, uh, of the isolation of the Belarusian state and Belarusian society. Um, and the examples is the agreement with Poland that uh, Poland would uh, acknowledge and recognize Belarusian diplomas, even though official Minsk left this agreement. They also agreed on creating a working group to support businesses, Belarusian business in working in Poland. They managed to regulate the topic and agree on the topic of the Belarusian students studying in Belarus, 
uh, Czech and Estonian universities. There was a special rapporteur appointed on this at the level of international organizations. Also, it's important to note that Belarus uh, made it to the statement uh, made by US President Biden when he visited Warsaw, uh, where he noted about the noted the uh, struggle of Belarusian democratic forces. And Tikhanovska uh, also became part of the trend which involved the necessity of Belarus living the a joint state with Russia and CSTO. Thank you very much, Pavel. And now I will give floor to Artem Shreiban. Artem Shreiban uh, is a busy researcher in the uh, not the foreign policy, but the uh, policy inside the country. Thank you very much. I um, Notice that the trends inside the country, inside the internal politics, they uh, continue. And majority of Belarusians can feel it. The political system became more um, isolated. Talking about the domestic policy. Lukashenko in February signed several important laws important for future political system two of them about the all uh, this uh, old belarusian uh, assembly we mentioned last time one of them falls into the same trend particularly it uh, launches the process of liquidation of the majority of those political parties and the minister of justice openly describes that she says that after the pre-registration process, there will be three to four parties instead of 15 that we have now. Uh, judging by the law signed by Lukashenko, we can say that everything there is uh, clearly shows that uh, the new Belarusian political configuration, uh, there will be no polit opposition political parties. In other words, the, all the parties should be following the, let's say, course of the All, po all People's Assembly. And the minimum number of people inside the party should be 5,000 people. So it's not so easy to make such parties. So in the next six months, we'll see the, the field of political parties, and both of them will be cleared and under pressure. There are some phantoms and ghosts, a ghost of the, uh, the soft political regime. And to fill this niche that will be left after the, the political field will be cleared, there'll appear the white Belarus political party, pro-governmental one. It's too early to talk about the transformation trend towards something more party related because the, in terms of amendments Lukashenko signed uh, those changes did not mention anything about the changes in the system of the proportionality system so there was a big chance that the white Russia or Belarus before and after the transformation will not be very much different from the party it used to be, at least in terms of its role in the system. So we just see the system being getting isolated. And the next issue of the tracker, there could be some changes because institutions that are created fictionally can assume another meaning. During the winter, the authorities launched the experiments that uh, look very much like softening of the was the softening of repression. Why quasi? Why pseudo? Because uh, it's ludicrous to talk about the softening because the number of arrests and number of Belarusians persecuted is getting bigger. But 
there were two initiatives adopted by the authorities. One is possibilities to um, pay off uh, your um, responsibility when thousands of people, after paying, after uh, spending money and uh, supporting f financially those democratic forces and uh, protest related forces. Those Belarusians were al allowed to sp send some money to uh, save themselves. And the second is the commission that we all know about. It's a quasi mechanism of uh, forgiven people's sins and the possibility to lift this load of responsibility for political uh, violations committed in 2020. We see that the tens of people, tens of people addressed to this commission, applied to this commission. But uh, at the beginning of March, none of the statements were in, in line with the requirements. So the official requirements. So it's still the, it's still the initiative active in the virtual world. So we cannot talk about the trend involved in softening of the repressions, but we see there's some uh, readiness on part of the authorities to play with the toolkit. This trend is at the very beginning, but so far we've seen the repressions been getting tougher. Now we see the experiments that could be interested, uh, in interesting for the future. New trend that I noticed with the is uh, the rejection the, the the bureaucracy has towards the radical activists that uh, have been active and we do have uh, examples in our report but there are signs that the system is trying to kick off although that like this case involving an uh, activist female activist Olga Bondareva, like the MP Igor Marzaluk was speaking against her. It, uh, the state media supported uh, Marzaluk in bulk and not the activist, the female activist that the law enforcement authorities usually support. And I believe that the wider coverage of this issue mentioning in talk shows shows that uh, the, the ideological block of the presidential administration is not happy with such activists. We'll see what it uh, will end up with, but uh, those are interesting examples that I've noticed. I believe this is a sign that the Russian political system that initially was built around demobilization about the practicality, it uh, started rejecting uh, this uh, foreign body uh, that is consists of the pro-Russian activists. This trend also is connected with the uh, growing influence of the prosecutor general, because Andrei Shviat, apart from being involved with the important case uh, about the uh, na Nazism and Belarusian people, he became the informal curator of the repressive actions of the state at least it's uh, law production part. He became part of the commission, but the head of the commission about the political immigrants. And pro-Russian activists appealed to him and M Marzaluk, MP Marzaluk appeals to him. Shved was supposed to prepare the meeting of the law enforcement bodies that took place today. Local uh, and Alexandri had prepared this similar meeting last year where Lukashenko was uh, scolding other representatives of the law enforcement bodies. So Andrei Shved is uh, in the position to propose the agenda and to formulate the agenda, which makes him privileged. The last point I wanted to make has to do with the democratic forces. It is the trend that 
continued since, uh, has been going on since autumn, the fragmentation of the Kyiv related center. It was joined by the Klinovsky regiment and uh, the Suprative movement. Now this coalition has been joined by Bozniak and his movement Free Belarus. They spoke about the coalition called uh, the Security Council and the, the development of this Kyiv related center. It's not only about ambition because there is a clear watershed. It's an ideological one. These forces that occupy the right flank, right flank of the Belarusian political sector. They're more radical than those forces around Tikhanovsky cabinet. They openly believe that it's not the peaceful but the war-related way uh, could lead to the occupation of Belarus. It's not only about personal misunderstanding with Tikhanovsky, but some conceptual differences. Other manifestations of this fragmentation trend that we have been witnessing, witnessing for several months, since autumn at least, was that the, the founding fathers of uh, the Tikhanovsky cabinet saw the, one of the main initiatives leaving it. And we saw that Tikhanovsky and her colleagues managed to cope without conflicts and coexist together with the coalition uh, of relatives of the political prisoners that are in favor of the more softer attitude to the government and in the, didn't have any conflicts associated with it despite different approaches to the to the issue and but another dimension of the cabinet's work was not that successful and here i mean the half a year deadline ended without reappointment of representatives coordinating council reform did take place there but there were conflicts there with Pavlatushka leaving the coordinating council so we can feel here there's uh, some promises that were not fulfilled and the mass perception of people that still follow on the democratic forces and their actions and as we know there are not very many of those in the eyes of those people these are all parts of this same conflict the same fragmentation well i think i stop here thank you very much for this thank you artem and now i suggest that we change the order of our speakers and the give floor to representatives of the economic experts Katerina uh, Bornokova. Thank you very much for joining us today. For an economic aspects, I usually divide into three uh, ways, West Russia and uh, uh, distant countries. We start with the West. Uh, the main thing that happened in the winter is that the sanctions of the EU were not did not involve Belarus, even though it was announced. The idea of uh, sanctions covering Belarus was that they were supposed to be synchronized with the Russian sanctions, and this way, thus, uh, stop Russia by passing sanctions used in Belarus. If we look at how the expert uh, is changing outside from EU to Belarus, we see that in the last several quarters it grew exponentially and actively, but this growth is not happening through Belarus alone. Uh, European goods go to Russia in bigger bulk through countries like Georgia, Kazakhstan and Turkey, and I think this is not the uh, 
the exhaustive list. So saying that by synchronized sections, by passing could be tackled is impossible. Another important event that took place between Belarus and the West, and it's also another element of the Iron Curtain Wall, is the closure of one of the uh, border crossing between Belarus and Poland. That uh, Poland is constantly reminding those that it can also close other border crossings, and uh, it's significantly. It was followed actually by Lithuania. Undoubtedly, this also this finishes the reputation of Belarus as being the transit hub. I would like to remind you that in the better years, Belarus received over two billion of clean uh, profit through the import. Last year it fell to three billion. Maybe this year will be even lower. What happened with the relation with Russia over the last several years? The Russia was trying to uh, get some concessions in terms of integration, and Belarus was trying to get more economic preferences. In winter 2023, Belarus managed to. Uh, uh, get uh, a lot of concessions like the structure of loans, including the loan related with the nuclear power plant, which is significant for Belarus. Uh, another important concession was the low gas price. They seem to have uh, agreed on the gas prices that are uh, profitable for Belarus, and Belarus allows itself not to uh, repay money to, to a private in investors of Russia, which confirms the default that was earlier announced by foreign agencies, but now it's clear that it exists. Most important thing that happened with the relationship between Belarus and Far Arc, or other countries placed further away from Belarus, there were several meetings in UAE and three visits to China, Zimbabwe, and UAE were covered in terms of economic achievements, but uh, I must say that in, in relationship with Zimbabwe, we shouldn't really expect big economic breakthroughs. And even the rumors that we do get about the lithium plant will probably not have significant macroeconomic achievements for Belarus. There will be favorable uh, results for several personnel, just not for the country as a whole. But as a result of the me visit to the UAE, we uh, learned that after VTIPS authorities claimed the increase uh, in the export volumes growth, we learned that the UAE is one of the countries that is used to bypass European and uh, American sanctions. And now we see that clear confirmation of that. In terms of VTIP's region, we can say that's uh, related to oil products. Last but not least was the visit to China. And relations with China uh, were not really great. I mean, the economic relationship, the investment, amount of investment was going down. A good uh, a report about this was uh, recently published by the uh, Bridge Foundation Library, but the restatement of this relationship gives hope for the further development. We don't know anything concrete about that. Indeed, it was said that the, the effect of the signed agreement could, achieve, could reach 3.5 billion US dollars, but uh, before that, 10, 15 years ago, there, there were even bigger sums announced, like 15 billions of credit line money. It doesn't mean that all of it will materialize, but uh, what attracted my attention among the agreements that they mentioned was the potential agreement of a free economic zone with China. If this succeeds, there will be a significant step showing that Belarus 
could be a serious partner for, in the eyes of China, economic partner. That's it from me. Thank you very much. I would like to remind your colleagues that your questions could be asked in the chat. Also, you can raise your hand there. After we have our speakers uh, presenting, we have a QA. I give floor to Livovsky. He'll be talking about internal econo economics. In the internal economic block, in the reported period, at the end of the 2020, at the beginning of 2023, the real GDP figures went down 4.7 percent. This is the biggest fall of the GDP since 1995, and that was it had to do with the move to the market economy. Only two fields grew in 2022. It's uh, agriculture and fishery and forestry, but it all got, got mixed up. It happened through due to the growth of the forestries and uh, thanks to the uh, significant crop growth. And the mining industry also grew. The others went down or were somewhere around zero. The three industries uh, decreased the most in 2022 was the construction industry, uh, trade industry, and the transportation activities. They decreased for, uh, by the amount of from 11 to 16 percent. In 2023, the trend, uh, this trend of economic downturn continued in January it uh, went down 5% compared to the January 2022. In February, it was uh, a little bit more than 2% compared to the previous year. We expect that this uh, effect will continue, but if we look at the figures related the, the com compared to, uh, with the previous year, we see that the economy is going down. But in terms of months, separate months, the uh, fall almost stopped, which means that in February, we'll see the fall, but starting from March and April, we should see zero fall. Also, in terms of microeconomic economic trends, we see the a real a salary trend well, previously, the real uh, salaries were going down at the end of the year, uh, thanks to the inflation going down. The real salaries went up in de December last year. There was 0.6% higher than the, those in 2021. And the next month, it was 1.6% more. 6, 1 .6 more. So we see here the trend uh, was not following the general economic trends. In 2023, in the construction was replaced by IT sector among the three top fallen industries, while in 2022, construction sector was one of the entities. In 2023, it shows the zero dynamics, so the situation improved there, while the IT sector the last several months was uh, fallen by 10 to 14 months, depending on a uh, percent, depending on the month. The budget deficit that was, uh, came, was made secret by the authorities, the default in help to uh, cover this hole in the budget, including the determinant of the payment for, of repayment of loans to Russia. It led to the authorities continuing the expensive uh, monetary policy and increases taxes. Many duties were increased at the end of 2022. A new law related to that stipulated the increase in various duties, like excise duties on tobacco, 
profits, virtual uh, gambling business, dogs, craftsmen, self-employed and sole proprietors saw the taxes increased. The entrepreneurs had the gas price increased, even though the gas prices for Belarus in total did not really increase in general. So all this in total led to the situation where the many small taxes were increased. The major tax here uh, has not been increased and the authorities are trying to stop uh, inc by increasing the smaller taxes, minor taxes. Antetyom Schreiber also mentioned that uh, the well, situation when people were, had to repay and atone for their payment that they made in favor of democratic forces. So people are offered to pay uh, for in favor of the state from 500 to $1,000. Recently we saw information that the non-IT uh, people uh, are asked to pay $1,500. Considering Strzak's statement about people who donated uh, in 2021 via Facebook in favor of the uh, Puerto funds, that sums could reach tens of thousands of millions of dollars. Artem mentioned this measure as innovation in the domestic policy, but I call it as the innovation, uh, mentioned as innovation of the fiscal policy because the, the donations could uh, increase the, the profits from the increase of the minor taxes. It's expected that 20 to 21 millions of euros and rubles will be uh, received by the state budget from the increase of the tax on the first apartment. Soft monetary policy also con continues. As to then the inflation was being tackled more actively, the inflation went down more significantly. Then it became significantly lower than it was in 2022. The key percentage rate was decreased by the central bank. And the last but not least, in terms of trends of this season, is the increasing pressure on businesses and the control over it in the last three months. The authorities were paying attention to the companies that have foreign capital in it. The number of companies whose shares could not be sold without the approval of the state grew from 193 to 1,149 companies. Companies that previously tried to leave the Belarusian market started to get punished. Important example here involved the Finnish brewery and that before that spoke about potential exit from the Belarusian market. Now the company called Olvia was fined and the record $12 million, which is a significant sum, significant fine for the Belarusian economy. They were fined probably for such actions, the desire to leave this uh, the Belarusian economy. Alexander Lukashenko continued to threaten the big players, but this time it was without mm, campaigns of people getting into prisons, but the state media published the uh, salaries of the top managers of the retail businesses. Well, I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Lev. Next speaker, Billy Bicano. He will, he will tell us about the dynamics of the popular opinion. Thank you, friends. Thank you for joining us today. I prepared for you a small presentation. I hope that in the next I'll manage to 
cover it in the next 20 minutes. I hope I um, ten will be enough though. You probably see my screen now in the presentation. Indeed, we can see it. Okay, here we go. First thing I wanted to mention is that we decided to change our methodology on collecting data. I'll uh, spend two or three minutes on that because it's important. In the past, we tried to make our sample similar to the sample involving people who are living in the urban area in Belarus with the internet access. We no longer do this. We present the online panel and the structure. It gives us the possibilities to compare various waves of our research. This way we reflect the trends that are happening in the Belarusian society. The full text of the report has more uh, explanation on this, on our methodology. Also, it has the data set. In order to not waste your time now, I'll uh, skip the details, but we have what we have. The fear factor needs to be brought up here because undoubtedly it affects the results of our survey, but still this time we managed to control uh, the monitor this fear factor through analyzing the dropout rate, the response and response rate. The response rate the number of people who um, participated into research. They received an invitation and didn't know what kind of research it will be. The dropout rate is the number of people who did not finish the survey. The dropout rate is 12% higher than the that and the commercial surveys. So we see the fear factor does affect the people's responses. So using the special, also using the special question, we managed to monitor this fear factor among those who finished the survey. But we cannot say that the fear factor affected this wave more than the previous one. So the trends that we are witnessing probably do exist in this society. What needs to be understood here? The figures, particularly in the next two slides, are not the figures reflecting the support of people in the society. We represent the online panel and the related trends. The previous data were also re reconsidered to reflect the online the panel. So we talk about the trend alone. We don't know the number of people who support the regime in Belarus. Definitely not in this research. But we do have the trends. So unfortunately, we can uh, talk about the trends that involve the distrust towards the state institutions. It can be reflected by the, our change in our data collection methodology and the new kind of sample that we have. We uh, shouldn't say, I could not say that it's explained entirely by this change of our approach. In the previous waves, there was a similar trend, but there was no panel that could confirm it. Also, there do exist explanations that uh, and there ex do exist factors that explain this trend and these trends. I mean, the changes in the society. Partially was mentioned by my colleagues, and we'll talk about this more later on. We see that all the indexes of social moods, uh, social optimism, uh, on the rise. Among those, the index of people perceiving the economic situation in the state, in the country. It was explained, but what Lev said, speaking before me, 
For example, it could be explained by the decrease in the inflation figures and uh, increase in the real salaries. I don't know how long it will last. This is a question to the economist. But we have what we have. The economic factors remain relatively important for the Belarusian society, even more important than those that are related with the war. A lot was uh, written about that in other surveys, particularly in the survey with identity that was held after Russia invaded Ukraine. So, there's no reason to think that the uh, foreign uh, factors became more important for Belarus than the domestic ones. Belarus still think and look inside the country and less what is happening inside it. Next, the drivers of such growth were the segments prone to distrust and the adamant supporters. It's quite clear with the latter group because the, these people, they continue trend about the rally around the flag. We mentioned that in the March and we wrote about this in the first issue of the first tra changes tracker. And those uh, prone to changes uh, connected with the depolitization. It is manifested in the following. In the low awareness about the political agenda in Ukraine, among other things. We see here two graphs. The first is about the joint transition cabinet. We ask people the question uh, if they know, if they heard about that, if, if that was the first time they heard about that. And the people said that Svetlana Dikhanovska declared, made a statement about the transition cabinet, and we see that only one segment is well informed about this, about the transition cabinet. And uh, this is a very important event for the democratic forces, was on the periphery of the information field for the majority of the society. So not many people really knew about this event uh, uh, in general. Also, we could talk about the uh, repression for pro-Ukrainian pro -Ukrainian stance. Only one segment knows about this kind of repression in Belarus. 58% of the people who are prone to distrust I'm not sure whether there were repression and the uh, repression in Belarus punishing people with pro-Ukrainian position. It is affected by the fear factor, but they would usually amount to five to seven percent. So the, the central segments, in other words, are more aware about, of the political agenda that we see, but it doesn't change the trend overall. Next, there does exist a demand for political uh, attitude to sanctions. We see only one segment that would want more sanctions. And then another segment that are prone to distrust don't have a consensus, don't show a consensus. Almost uh, half of the people want to, the sanctions to be lifted from Belarus. It could be explained by the fact that the Russians in general want to be friends with uh, all countries of the world. They want to have a relationship with the East, with the West, with China, with the US, and only the politicized people believe uh, uh, have the their own values that are transformed in their political stance but th this is a demand for detail uh, they talent because this pressure needs to be stopped at least that's what those people think in terms of war it is another factor influencing the level of trust 
towards the, the government institutions. So the society is divided in terms of its support of towards Ukraine or Russia in the war. We see that there are certain, there's certain correlation, as we noticed back in March 2022. This correlation remains between uh, the trust towards the pro-government agencies or mistrust towards them. And this explains the major part of the support towards Ukraine or Russia. Here, we asked the question if people are, agree that it was a mistake on the side of Russia to attack Ukraine. Among the people who are prone to trust, we see that many of them uh, believe it was a mistake. It, it, it means that in this society there is no dominating line in terms of support of either Ukraine or Russia. The dominate line here, in fact, is the anti-war consensus. Here we see the army of Belarus must not take part in the war on any side. That's what people think. It's a dominant position that uh, all segments share dependent on independent of the trust and mistrust towards the regime it shows to us that the support of towards for you or for russia that we saw at the beginning is a very inert or passive a lot has been written about that my colleague Gennady, Gennady Korshino, wrote about that and uh, Rogora Stapenia wrote about this in the Chatham House survey. So it means that the support for Russia shows that people think of, you, of Russia as being the magnet in the region, a dominant in the region, the dominant country in the region. And it's perceived by the people who support Russia as something equal to the Western countries, not only in terms of military sense, but also in terms of technological, cultural dimensions. Considering the fact that the population of Belarus touches upon the war only through the media, or through the eyes of the media, and sees the media picture of it, or the Russian or Belarusian propagandists, or those of uh, independent media. This, the support of this or that side in the war, particularly the support of Russia, is connected with the stereotypes that existed in Belarus, not in only in the last 30 years, but during the Soviet times. The active support or desire to help Russia in the war is non-existent, and it hasn't been there. In terms of conclusion, I must say that the dynamics that we are witnessing in the people's support of the governmental agencies is a manifestation of a demand, not, not just for stability, because the Chatham House survey shows a big demand for changes. So many people want grave changes. The majority of the people in those believe that the country needs reforms. But even those people believe that those should not be shock-related reforms, but they should be quiet, soft. These dynamics shows that there's a demand for quiet and peaceful times. People want the, the turbulent times to be over. They want Belarus not to get involved in this. We understand, you and me, understand that Belarus has already been involved in this process, but the society at large believes that Belarus still hasn't been involved in this catastrophe. And so 
the improvement I mean the temporary ones at the war front could lead to the strengthening of the this feeling of peace that leads to the increased trust toward the pro-governmental institutions among the people who get become depoliticized and for whom 2020 happened three years ago unlike for many people who who still believe the events of the 2020 the tragic events so we'll see how it, it will unravel but that's what we have now thank you that's it for me Anton, microphone. Ah, da, uh, thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe. Allow to give floor to Gennady Korshnov. He'll talk about the relationship between the society and the authorities. Thank you. Oh, hello, everyone. Glad to see all of you here. My task is difficult today. I was supposed to theoretically conclude everything that was said before me, but I doubt that I will succeed. Still, I do have some references to all my colleagues today. My blog is called Relationship Between the Society and the Authorities. And here I have a views on the recent tendencies, recent trends. First thing that I wanted to note is the, the fact that repressions has not a, has been ongoing. What what Artyom said of it being quasi and suited its nature is totally true. The repression uh, is moving in all directions. More and more people get arrested. Uh, Families are getting detained, and uh, relatives are taken hostage. There were sentences, similar sentences, repeating themselves. There are cleanses of uh, disloyal people at the enterprises, which involves not only removal of them from the workspace, but also in ability of them to later find a, any job or a decent job. This trend remains among the recent trends and of what the Leof and Artyom mentioned. On my part, I, will, I uh, would like to mention the new kind of light repression, like sort of uh, forgiveness. And monetization of the repression responsibility. The, another new thing that was actually announced quite a long time ago is the launch of the practice of the uh, court sessions in absentia. Absentia. This practice has been gaining pace in the last several months. This practice is actually was. Uh, invented as the practice of uh, fighting those who have left the country and could be seen as one of the elements of the so-called quiet war against the diaspora. This war started uh, quite a long time ago. Now it's resurfaced again, manifested in many ways, different ways. It started with the recognition of the diaspora chats as being extremist ones, and this practice continues. The second direction is that there's a movement towards of uh, Belarusians who left the country, leaving, uh, getting the rights removed and limited. Uh, they uh, no longer can have the free medical assistance and uh, students of the foreign universities uh, cannot uh, will not be able to avoid army draft information is collected about the school students whose 
parents and left Belarus. Here also plays the major role of, of necessity to announce, to, to notify the authorities about the people, Belarusians getting a uh, living permit in other countries. Consulates are charging more these days and uh, and uh, less and less help is provided to Belarusians abroad by the consulate. Big example here is when Belarusian embassy in uh, Berlin decided not to help relatives of the Belarusian who died. Uh, another position, another point that I wanted to mention is the uh, desire of the state to increase the spheres of control inside the country. Important practice here uh, of a practice of making drafting lifts of people who cannot be trusted. It started with the list of musicians. In winter, there appeared a list of potentially there were people that are in unreliable people, the list of such called unreliable people. In March, there were several lists like this. One of them involved people who like who like to uh, shoot the guns. Two more uh, laws were passed that uh, should be noted. One is about uh, providing psychological assistance based on it. Representatives of the enforcement borders get uh, received uh, access uh, to the information that should be covered by the client uh, privilege. And next law is about the information system functioning. It involves the possibilities of law enforcement being able to receive unlimited information. I mean, digital information about a certain person. Uh, not only from, it basically means that uh, surveillance getting institutionalized. In the wake of this, should be mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the state is uh, encroaching on the private spheres of life, like the healthcare and health, starting from the 1st of general, the Ministry of uh, Health has to um, monitor the health of every citizen once a year. So every citizen of Belarus, depend, independent of their willingness and age, must get medical checked, checked by the... This next uh, sphere is the family sphere. At the meeting of the Supreme Court, was said that the court should uh, um, be able to reconcile the spouses who want to get a divorce. Separately, all these trends that I mentioned could be seen as the care of the state, but together they show that this care turns into the certain leash that involves more and more spheres. It's more written in the report about that. Please check the report for this. And last point, my last point, is that in Belarus, we can talk about the two spaces of the civil society. One, um, the third started to destroy it in 2021 now involving the legal base. Secondly, the number of the 
legal acts that were passed. Recently, they created a foundation for the state related civil society, however strange it sounds. Still, it must be said that independent civil society continues to exist both inside and outside Belarus. In Belarus, they can only exist as partisans. So it shows only indirectly. And unfortunately, we cannot talk about that too much for security reasons. On the other, the other hand, the consequences of the actions displayed by those partisans could be seen by everyone. Second point is that what is done by the diaspora, indeed we can see it and it should be noted, there's a big trend towards institutionalization of various structures of uh, civil society. Now it's gaining pace, we can talk about the creation of the Association of uh, Belarusian Veterans, Fighting for Ukraine, the Institute of Belarusian Book and Belarusian Academy of Sciences, and so on and so forth. So these processes are unraveling. The research shows that the majority of the civil activity of Belarusians outside the Belarus is happening outside the institutional space. Where people are doing a lot on their own initiative. which shows that the Belarusian civil society abroad has a significant reserve to develop further. Thank you, that's it for me. Thank you, Ignat. Now let's uh, start the session of question and answers. You can write your questions in the chat or raise your hands. This way we'll, you'll be able to ask your question with the voice. Well, the first question is, uh, towards Philip, the four segments of the uh, the society that you mentioned, are they similar in terms of size or is each of these segments about 25% of all the survey or are they very different? If so, which segment is bigger than others? Thank you for your question, but I need to explain. First and foremost, this data is available for everyone. They'll be available in the technical annex, technical appendix. There'll be a, a link to the data sets. You'll be able to download it in the SPSS or Excel format and play with data analyze it on your own. Here we can talk about the number of such people on the online panel. Such segments are different in terms of size, which is uh, obvious, because the majority of the, of the people that we surveyed uh, can be found in the middle segments and those prone to trust are about 40%, if my memory serves me correct. 41 or 42%. 22 to 24% uh, include the ardent supporters, and the rest is similar sizes. I don't really remember well the clearly. It's not uh, the best time for me to dig into it, but we do uh, the exercise free to them. The, the most important thing here is the trends and the dynamics. The, because the I can hear the echo, please, colleagues. If you can, please turn off the microphones when you don't speak. 
So this is not that important. Because we should follow the, the trend of dynamics and to understand what's happening inside those trend, those segments. We don't know the number of, of those people. And we only can see the trends. We're trying to monitor the fear factor, the dropout factor, and talk about the trends, find the foundation of changes. But when we analyze separately, let's say the structure of the people who are prone to trust or distrust or ardent opponents or proponents, we can say that in this society is happening as well. Considering the fact that on, in online panels people are more active, we can say that if the person is against the regime, he will probably uh, have the same attitude to Ukraine as the people from the segments that are against the regime. Hope I answered your question. Thank you, Philip. The next question. Maybe this question uh, will be addressed to Artyom. Maybe some other speakers would like to answer it. What is your opinion about the increase of influence of Russia and Belarus and uh, the spread of its propaganda? Is it stem? Is does it have to do with the suppression of its oppo opponents? Don't you think that in those among the Belarusian authorities there are people who are in favor of integration of Russia and uh, the proponents of in independence and the latter group is given up. Do you think that the Belarus society wants to change as much as uh, to desire the, to integrate inside Russia, considering the fact that Ukraine may win the war? At least four segments have been touched upon here, so I don't want to usurp and the reply, it's a very comprehensive question. I don't know how can we assess the number of people who are in favor or against integration of Russia inside the Belarusian regime. I only have the feeling that over the last year, more and more significant role was gained by the proponents of the unity with Russia, military unity and economic unity. I cannot uh, say, however, that there are more people of such people now, but there are, of course, opponents of the, the Ruski Mir, Russian world. But some uh, allies of Moscow and Russia resurfaced. But both in the Russian Belarusian propaganda, state propaganda, and in the actions of Belarusian authorities connected with the Belarusian patriotic camps and the normalization of the pro Russian propaganda, indeed we get the feeling that there is a more active, the more active actions of the pro-Russian camp inside the Belarusian uh, bureaucracy, bureaucratic levels. I don't know if you had it in the previous service, uh, I'm not sure. But Chatham House definitely had this. Regora Stapenia, who's in charge of this. Uh, we can cyclically see the polarization of political uh, moods. The pro. Oh, yeah, it was uh, Philip Pikanov had it in his research of identity. In brief, uh, the pro Russian and pro European segments are on the rise, have been on the rise over the last year, and the pro neutral middle is uh, decreasing. However, it's still the, in the majority, I mean, this middle. 
the situation is strange. There is no single trend apart from polarization. But the society remains separated and uh, split. So talking that uh, we'll have the majority of the proponents of Russia is impossible. The number of people skeptical towards CSTO is growing. According to Philip, uh, there are more and more people who doubt uh, the Russia's actions in Ukraine both among the proponents and the opponents of the Belarusian authorities. So these are fluctuations that we are witnessing that are compensated by the polarization. Maybe some of the speakers would like to add something to what was said by Artem. Maybe you, Philip. Artem actually uh, did a great job covering uh, what was mentioned. I will just join what he said, uh, echo what he said. Apart from anti-military co consensus, and Gennady will confirm that over the last 20 years, maybe more, there has been a consensus in favor of independence. Maybe it's good to get integrated with Russia, but the majority of such people did not understand what the integration would be like. So the desire to be together with Russia is not really rational, particularly if we compare it uh, with the desire to move towards Europe or neutrality, which are more pragmatic in nature. The people want to a better life. Uh, in terms of Russia, uh, the, the proponents of, the, of it say that we have always been together with Russia, we've always been friends, we are brotherly peoples, but how this unity should and what this unity should look like was unclear in the minds of the people. They say that we should be together, but we can be separate. I didn't see more than three or five percent in favor of the single country, single state. I will add a few points. On my side, I will talk about the society. Always there's a big share of pro-Russian Belarusian citizens have has existed. They were in favor of the joining Russia, but in the last dozen of years, the share of them was five to seven percent. Among those people who are in favor of total unification, um, the number remained the same. The importance of independence of Belarus that uh, shows itself in the selection of the middle ground. The importance of the independence is the, the phenomenon that unites the proponents and opponents of the regime. This is, can be clearly seen uh, by the quantitative research and the analysis of the open questions and the deep interviews. Some people say that we should be with Russia or with Europe, but both camps say that we must be independent. Thank you very much. Next question. What do you think? How stable is uh, uh, trend towards the uh, movement towards the Europe. Who wants to answer this question? Yeah, the, the demand for stability has always been there. And in terms of the economy, it's very important. The 
current problem in Belarus is that the worst thing is not only that some uh, figures and trends go down, is that uh, we don't have stability. We see the change in the laws every month. We see the change in the rules of the game. And it's uh, particularly relevant to the, uh, entrepreneurs. Nobody is sure about the rules that they will have in 12 months. So in every economic situation, entrepreneurs and people get adapt with time. But the stability that they're witnessing now does not allow to adjust through due to the constant change. And uh, here I want to quote the uh, deep interviews. One of the main demands here is uh, for stability and for understanding the, the status quo. And this waves in each side, the uh, getting on people's nerves because it can, can be witnessed in, at all the levels. People are um, uh, constantly moving from uh, west to the east. It has to do with the educational system because every year people don't know the rules that will be applied to the school leavers, future graduates, future students. So uh, there's a huge demand for stability here. And this demand will, of course, grow further. Thank you very much. Well, I guess we don't have any more questions in the chat. So I'd like to remind you that uh, you can read the research in full at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation website. There will be links uh, in this chat to the English and Russian versions. And to all those registered for this event, we will send the materials as soon as this presentation is over. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, speakers. And uh, till next time. Thank you. Until next time. Goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Till next time.